We are Havas, and we like to break things to make them better. We broke investing, exploding taboos around money talk by humanizing trading. I like you. We broke insurance, trading gimmicks for straight talk. Then wham! We broke computing, navigating a seismic shift from traditional computing to training AI. We broke fear, saying so long to beaches and bros and hola to the most interesting man in the world. Stay thirsty, my friends. We broke banking, revamping rewards to turn business transactions into an emotional engagement. We even broke your coffee pot, oh. flipping it from an ordinary appliance to an integral part of your life. All in the hips, baby, all in the hips. And we broke a whole lot more to create an unfair advantage. We are Havas, and we're breaking tradition. Okay, so this is Havas, and I'm the current uh, CEO of the Canadian division. And I'm going to spend the next uh, probably 30 to 45 minutes explaining uh, and telling you a little bit of my story about how we got here. Um, so just bear with me. I'll tell you a lot of stories about the journey, and uh, hopefully at the end there's you know one little nugget and something that you guys can go home with. So it was 2008, and I was, my husband and I, Sepp, who um, were business partners at the time, we became business partners, we were sitting at the TD Bank, um, and it, it was day 60 of starting this new business called Plastic Mobile. And we were sitting there because um, we had gotten our first client, um, we started working with Rogers, and it was amazing, it was a big client, you know, we were getting an amazing, some amazing projects out of them, and 60 days had passed, and we had hired some people, and we'd used all the funds we possibly had, and anything that we'd saved up, and uh, payroll was coming up. So we sat at the bank, and we said, you know, I was 26 years old, he was probably 28, and we sat at the bank, and we said, we need $100,000. And the advisor's looking at us. He looks at our paperwork. He looks at, you know, companies two months old. You have no assets. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Um, I remember sitting there, and and I turned around to Sepp, and I, 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 you know, we whispered a couple of things, and we had no choice. I had to make payroll, and we literally had no other options. And I turned around to him, and I said okay, listen, we, ha we have this house, and the housing market had, it was a condo, and the housing market had done quite well. I'm sure there's some equity in that. Can we just borrow against that? And he looked at us, and I think he thought we were crazy, but he looked at us, and he said, well, that's possible. Probably not advisable, but possible. So <laughs> in that moment, um, I, I realized something, and then that realization would carry with me for the next 10 years as we built our business, as we sold our business, and as I moved into this current role. I realized that, oh, it's not here, but I realized that the first no is just a suggestion. <laughs> and that I have a choice to push past it and to try to get a yes on the next time I try to ask. So that's how Plastic Mobile was born. We did take that loan. We took the $100,000 out of our house because we believed in our business. Uh, and I'll take you back. Um, in 2008, uh, Blackberries were very big, but only business people used them. Consumers didn't use them. And clicking on the icon that had the internet would charge you hundreds of dollars, so no one dared touch on that icon. <laughs> And Steve Jobs had gone on stage and he'd released this amazing new device called the iPhone. And people were intrigued and really interested. And so we felt it. We knew that the world was changing and we were just at the beginning of it and that we wanted to be along for that ride. We knew that 
um, actually the app stores hadn't even been released yet. So we were building, I, I like to call it pirate apps, um, uh, uh, you know, black market applications for brands because we thought that it would offer them a new touch point to their customers, a new way of direct communication that, had, that was you know, just in time that had never been done before in the history of marketing or advertising. So we really did believe in the space. And uh, we named the company Plastic Mobile. Um, and, and we started with the first few clients. So as I said, our first client was Rogers and we started working with them on 680 News. Um, and what we did with 680 News is we took their news content, so the weather, the traffic, um, and the news, and we put it on Blackberries so that at any time, instead of waiting for traffic on the 10s, you could actually listen to traffic anytime you needed. Um, and then we took some of their other properties like Shadow Lane, which were magazines, physical magazines, and we moved them onto the mobile platform, and we helped people um, you know, customers that were starting to slowly get on the mobile platform to, to be able to consume their content in the mobile space. And, and we were doing well. Um, but like any startup or new business, um, the first few years were really tough. There were a lot of sleepless nights, uh, takeout, pizza boxes piling up at the office, um, and a lot, of, a lot of disappointments and a lot of doors slammed in our face. You know, I remember one of the meetings I went to, I actually went back to Unilever, which was my very first job, and I said, this is what I'm doing, and here's what it is, and this is the future. And I remember somebody in the meeting going, oh, this mobile thing, it's just a fad, it's gonna pass. You know, it's, it's like Facebook, that's a fad, and mobile, that's a fad, it's all gonna pass. I remember walking out that door, <laughs> hearing a lot of no's, um, but being really uh, convinced that this was gonna be the future, and this is where we were gonna, we were gonna be. So we, we worked along, and then we got our big break, and how that happened. So we were doing some really good work at Rogers, and there was a guy by the name Nader Elm. He was the guy who gave us our first chance. He gave us the first project. He let us work. And he happened to have gone to university with Paul Goddard, who's the current CEO of Pete's Pizza. And um, uh, Paul Goddard gives us a call one day. He's like, Hi, how are you? I was given your number you know, from Nader, and he said you guys are doing some really great work. And you know, we are you know, Canada's largest pizza retailer, and we need to do an application. We need to be first in market. Nobody else is doing it in Canada, and we need you guys to do this for us. And I mean, it was exciting. It was a big brand for us. It was our first foray into transactional commerce, and, and we knew that the future was uh, headed that way. So. Uh, we wanted to work with him really badly, but I had this gut in, I, oh, and, and I remember him saying is, one of the, the things he said is, we need to be first to market. So I don't care if we have to do a location finder or put our phone numbers in an app or do whatever, but we just need to be first. And I remember I had this gut instinct, and I was like, we really, really want to work with this brand, but their customers don't want a location finder. Like, their customers want to order pizza. That's why they're going to Pete's Pizza. They want to order pizza, and they want it to arrive at their door 30 minutes later. Um, so, I, and I said it. I spoke up, and I said, you know, this is what I think. You, you know, we've been in the mobile space for a couple of years now, and your customers are becoming more advanced, and this is what they want. I remember, I think he said no, but I don't know if I heard it. <laughs> I have a hard time hearing that first no. So, I said, okay, let me take it back. I'm going to come back with a proposal. So we take it back, and the team gets together, and for a week, we just spend the whole week researching. We take a look at um, consumers, the demographic that they have, how they're using applications. We look south of the border into the US, and if there are any pizza retailer uh, apps out there. We went all the way to Australia and the UK, and I remember Australia was pretty advanced. They actually had a commerce a pizza retailer, I think it was Pizza Hut, that had a live app. And their app actually gave consumers the ability to order pizza. But for some, I'm not really sure, I'm gonna call this a technical limitation because it otherwise doesn't make sense. But for some reason, they couldn't order pop. So like, <laughs> honestly. So all the reviews in the app store were like, we love the app, we love the pizza, but we can't order pop, so like, why would I do this? I need my, like, 
this is crazy. So review after review after review would say this. And so, you know, we gathered all of our information and I went back to Paul Goddard and I said, listen, we've done all of our homework. We've done all of our research. Look what's happening in Australia. We know that it would be wrong to put out a location finder for your customers. We, and if you want just a location finder, we're not the right partner for you because we don't actually believe that that's the right thing to do for you or for your customers. Lucky for us, he seemed to agree, um, and he actually let us go forward and move on with um, creating the full end-to-end -end experience where uh, customers can actually go on, order the pizza, order their pop, <laughs> or anything else they want to order, and then be able to have it arrive at their door 30 minutes later, and they can track actually the time it takes and, and get their pizza guarantee. Um, and everything was going fine. You know, we got the contract, we started building, we're going through testing. It takes us about six months, and three months of that is testing because you have to make sure, like, when you press click, it goes to the right store and it has the right ingredients, and that store creates it and goes to the right address. So there's a lot of complexities. And we're about two weeks out from launch, and I get this email in my inbox from Paul Goddard, and it says, Domino's app in App Store. Two weeks, we just need two more weeks. So I quickly run, I go to the app store, and I open up the application, and then like, I feel this sense of relief. You know, they had done a location finder. <laughs> <laughs> because it was quick, and they could. So I wrote back to Paul, and I go, okay, listen, I know we weren't first, and I know that was really big for you, but just hold tight, just, Two weeks. Give us two weeks. The app's going to launch. I promise you it's going to be great. Just give us some time. So, I mean, he didn't really have much choice anyway, but he gave us the time. <laughs> um, and two weeks later, we ended up launching, and we had amazing reviews and amazing feedback from customers. I remember at the time, um, we had set up like a, 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 um, a call-in line just for the app in case we had any troubles or if there, in case there was anything. There was dedicated service. And I think... The thing was live for probably like six months and we had like one call go into the call center so they shut that, that direct line down. So our app was performing really well and a couple months after uh, our app launched, I decided to go back just to see what, how Domino's was doing. I mean, I was curious. Obviously, I'd taken a bet. I had said that, you know, this is what we should do and so I go back into the app store and I press Domino's. I'm like, wait, why is their app not here? So it turns out they had actually pulled their app off the app store and didn't actually get another app back onto the market for two whole years. So, you know, I forwarded that to Paul <laughs> and said, I think we made the right choice. Um, and I know that today, if he were here, he would undoubtedly say that we made the right choice because when we started working with them, about 10% of their orders was going through their digital channel, so they had a website. Today, more than 55% of their orders goes through either the websites or the apps, so through the digital channel. So I think he knew that it, the right thing to do was to focus on the customer and give them what they needed. So things were going well. We had our big break. We used it as our case study, and we were doing well. We were gaining traction. We were gaining customers. What happens next? So people started hearing about us, um, and we started being asked to pitch and be involved in RFPs. And at by this time, a lot of other players had caught on that this is, this is lucrative. Like, we could offer this to our clients. So we had a lot of competitors, and they were large competitors, like IBM, Deloitte Digital, PwC. Um, these guys were all in the mobile space now, and we were competing for work with them. And so this was probably now 2013 or 2014. I get an RFP, a request for proposal, come on my desk, and... It's for Shoppers Drug Mart, and they're pretty open. They actually had a very open bidding process, so they allowed all of us to ask questions. We knew who the, the participants were, and there were 19 competitors. And I could tell you probably out of 19, 17 of them were larger than we were. Um, and we went, through the, we went through the process. We were probably the only group that was very specialized and heavily niche in the mobile space and actually had experience uh, delivering with our Pizza Pizza and some of the other work that we had done. So we ended up being shortlisted, and we were down to the bottom two. 
Uh, and again, it was a very open process, so it was us and, a, and another very specific mobile competitor, but they were probably about five times our size at that point. And um, I remember it was Friday afternoon. We had just worked hard for two weeks. We were just putting the content together, pitching, working really hard to get shortlisted. And uh, we get an email saying, we'd like to come for a chemistry test and a site visit Tuesday morning. So it's Friday now. And we will be coming with these people. And there's a list of about 10 people. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, our largest boardroom holds eight people. <laughs> they want to bring 10, and we need about five. And that's not going to work in our boardroom. And so there's a bunch of us, we were sitting down, we were talking about it, and I remember my head of creative at that point was like, Mel, we can't do this. We gotta stop now. We'll just tell them like, it's not the right fit, and we won't embarrass ourselves and we won't bring them in. And I remember thinking, we've just worked months to get here. I am not bowing down now. So let me explain the situation. We were in a building in Liberty Village, for any of you that are familiar in Toronto, and in Liberty Village, uh, the buildings there were set up for a lot of startups. So there are a lot of small, uh, large buildings, but all the units are fairly small. And we had taken over three spaces, broken down the walls, and we had a fairly large space. We were about, uh, probably about like 30, 40 people at that time. And the office next to us had just emptied out two weeks before. And so I said to my head of marketing, can you go talk to Mr. Pearl? and see if we can borrow the space next door for just 24 hours. This was Monday, Monday afternoon. And then tell him if we win, we're gonna take it. And so she did, and like, I think they must have thought we were crazy. But they were like, okay, these, give it to them because we're not using it, no one's using it, 24 hours is not gonna hurt us, we can be good to our tenants. Um, so we take the space, so now we have a space. We have a space for a meeting. It's a massive space, but it's empty. It's just space with concrete and walls. Um, and I turn around to one of my other staff and I say, okay, now we need furniture. <laughs> so she's like, no problem. I rented a truck and we're heading out to Ikea. <laughs> For sure, all of this happened, this is not a joke. <laughs> Sounds like it's made up, but it's for real. So <laughs> two of them, they're actually both girls, They get into this truck, they rent this big truck, they go out to Ikea, they buy 30 desks and like 50 chairs. <laughs> they bring it into the office. We end up installing office furniture from about 8 p.m. all the way till one in the morning. <laughs> and I remember I had just had my daughter, she was one years old, it was my first child, I had to go pick her up from daycare and bring her into the office and she loved it because she was playing in boxes and that's what kids love to do at one. So I have this like mental image of her playing in, in the cardboard boxes as we're assembling furniture. So we ended up assembling the furniture, we staged the space. Um, the idea was to understand our process, so we build stations about this is what we do in design, this is what we do in development, this is how we do quality assurance, and we staged the entire place. And we are ready for our meeting. And they, came the, and they came the next day, it was like nine in the morning, they came into the offices. And you know, I walked them through, I said, oh, this, these are our offices, you know, whatever, but here's the space next door, we've actually taken it over and we haven't had time to you know, tear down the walls yet, but we're working through construction, you know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's like, oh, okay, great. And they walk into the office and we ended up putting like, our best foot forward um, and, and we showed the client exactly how we work. Um, and when they left, on the way out, they, they shook our, my hand, they shook everybody's hand, and they're like, this was really amazing. You know, before we came here, we were really leaning the other way, but I think this site visit solidified it for us. And we ended up winning. <laughs> Thank you. And so, so that was exciting. We won uh, against 19 other top, top, top players in the Canadian space. It felt like it was absolutely impossible. People said no, but we went on and we did it. Um, and, then, and then things were going well. You know, we continued to build um, and we continued to grow our company. And then we came to a place where uh, we thought that our company uh, should 
have a purpose and should believe in, in a cause and should really help pursue and advance the space forward. So I'm really passionate myself in, 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 in women and leadership roles. And so, uh, and uh, my leadership team is actually made up of, of uh, probably skewed female and male, which is very unheard of in the tech, technology space. Uh, we all really believe in this cause. So for, this is 2017, for Canada's uh, 150th anniversary, we thought we wanted to do something. Uh, we thought that uh, there are amazing women in Canada. Uh, and we thought the number 150 was really appropriate because it's the 150th birthday. And we thought if we went out and we scoured Canada and we found the top 150 women, that we could probably get some really amazing advice for them to give down to the next generation of females. And that if that generation of females saw that there are amazing women doing amazing things, Olympians, CEOs, uh, you know, board members, chairs, that they could see themselves in those positions one day. So we said we were going to create a book. Uh, we were going to call it Your Turn. And we were going to make it so that you can pass it down to the next generation. The problem was that it was for Canada's 150th anniversary. And it was April. <laughs> and the 150th anniversary ends in November because December is holiday. And we had to find 250 women because out of that 250, we had to convince 150 of them to actually write something for us. And then we had to take that advice and we have to pass it through an editor. And then once it's gone through the editor and the design of the book is done, then we have to actually ship it to China and we have to get it published and we have to get it printed. And all of that seemed really, really tight and, and, and some people thought we were crazy. I remember I was sitting with our head of strategy and creative and he just stormed into my, actually I wasn't sitting with him, he stormed into my office one day and he's like, I know we like to do things, but like, why are we wasting people's times when we know it's not going to be possible? <laughs> okay, I know the timelines are tight, and I know it's a little challenging, it's going to be hard getting 150 women, but we're committed to it, and I know we can do it. And so we did that, and we did it by sheer grit. <laughs> like, I, had a, uh, I created a, a separate email called 150 Women, and I reached out to probably every woman at least five times. And then once I reached out and got people to agree, then my team actually had to follow up with them probably another five times to actually get their submissions and then had to pass it back and forth and get it reviewed by them once we were completed. And it was a lot of work. But you know, in November, it was November in 2017, we had a massive event with 250 people. 150 of them were contributing women, top of the top in Canada. Some flew out of... Uh, you know, all over the place from the east and the west to be at our event, and we launched this book that we could then pass on to the next generation. The thing about this was that we didn't, you know, we did a print run, and we thought, okay, you know, a thousand should be enough, we'll give away some at the event, and then people can take others. But when we launched, literally, we didn't think that 150 women probably have people that love them, that want their books. That <laughs> <laughs> or that they probably have kids and grandkids that they want to pass this book to. We didn't really anticipate that we were going to sell out by like 48 hours after we launched the book. And all proceeds went to a local charity. But we ended up having to actually do a second run before the event actually launched. So it ended up being a massive success for us and something that we find uh, as one of our accomplishments. Um, and then as things were going well... There were, throughout the years, there were always people that came to us. We had a unique skill. We had something that people wanted. We had a great culture, um, lots of amazing clients. So we had a lot of people approach us for acquisition. And we didn't really consider it because, like, who wants to have a boss, really? Um, <laughs> I mean, I have one today, but at that point, that's how I felt. Um, and, and we didn't really want to sell until we got to a point where we felt... We were good enough to compete for almost any large project that was out there, but we couldn't be trusted to be around in the long term, and, and we weren't really a big enough neck to be able to choke if something went wrong. So we found ourselves in a really hard position where we had to decide, in order to go to the next level, in order to be able to scale and to really grow, 
We're going to need a partner that has that scale, that has that global presence that's going to allow us to do that. So in 2015, um, when we were considering selling our company, we spoke to a lot of advisors, we spoke to a lot of colleagues, we spoke to a lot of friends, and pretty much everyone told us not to do it. Like, everyone said no. You're going to lose your autonomy, they're going to take over, you're going to hit your life. <sighs> But we knew that for our company to be able to get to the next level that we had to do this. So we ended up going, uh, uh, we ended up dating a lot of companies and we finally settled on the acquisition with Havas. So Havas is a global, is one of those other really large companies no one's ever heard of. Uh, <laughs> we are 40,000 employees owned by Vivendi Universal Music, so a massive company, uh, 360 offices and 120 uh, countries in the world, and uh, mostly focused on marketing and communication. Um, and the acquisition was meant to uh, bring in mobile capabilities into, uh, as a practice, into the group. And so we went uh, with them, and we were acquired in 2015. And five years have passed since that date. And we were able to uh, quadruple our size in these past five years, uh, triple our profits. Um, and to us, it was the right move for our company. We were able to bid for uh, some very, very large accounts that normally we wouldn't have. We probably today work with all of the top banks that we never would have had the opportunity because the, um, the master sales agreements with those companies are very difficult to get. And a company like Havas has the backing to be able to, uh, to get into those uh, companies. So I would say it was definitely the right move for our company. And then, and then with me, you know, oftentimes when an acquisition happens, the company being acquired, roles like mine would typically go away. So, you know, as the, the leader of the previous company, the acquirer would come in and the first thing that happens is the duplicate roles at the top start to disappear. And my role was probably the first to go away. But I wasn't done. <laughs> I had so much work ahead of me and I had so much to grow and I had this vision. And in our network, there's a lot of people that do advertising, but there are not a lot of people that do technology. And there are not a lot of people that understand the digital space. And I saw that as a white space in our network, and I saw that as an opportunity. So, so for the first three years or four years, that three years that we were part of the acquisition, the first three, I worked really hard to grow my profits and grow my revenue to the point where I was 75% of the entire Canadian operation. And so, so I had a lot of confidence, so I went to the seniors at BE and I said, you know, I have 75% of this business, and you know I've done well. The acquisition's done well for me. I'd like to take over. I'd like to take the senior leadership role, and I'd like to move the company in a technical and digital direction. And they said, "We think you're amazing. We think that you can. If there's anyone who can, anybody who could do it, it's you. But you now have a lot of money, and you could just retire." And I felt really hurt. <laughs> I was like, "I've worked so hard. I've committed myself." And I've put everything into this company, and I absolutely deserve to lead, and the direction I want to take is the right direction. But they're not going to give it to me. But the first no is a suggestion. And I believe that. <laughs> so I worked hard for one more year. I kept working. I grew the profits again. I grew the revenue again, so now I, I probably, you know, I'm bringing in about 85% of the entire company portfolio. And I'm like, again, and I'm like, okay, now, we talked about this last year, but I think it's even more relevant now. Look what's happening in Toronto. The space is booming with tech and digital, and it's the right direction for the company. And this time they agreed. So in January, um, I was named the CEO of the division. Uh, in Canada, and um, over the next couple of months, we're actually doing a rebranding, and we are relaunching the company to be digital and tech-focused. 
And then hopefully what we can do over the next three to five years is to expand that south of the border and to build this practice in a much larger capacity um, in, the, in the US market. So that's what I hope to do. Um, and I think if there's, you know, and I think as I move into this larger role and this larger mandate, you know, our, our culture as a company, as a small company, is changing and shifting and it's morphing. But there's one piece of the culture that I think is going to forever remain in our DNA. And that's the, that the no's and the can'ts can always be changed into the yeses. And that's what we're going to do moving forward. So that's my story. And uh, I don't know if you guys, are, if I, I didn't teach you guys anything. <laughs> uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and if there's, you know, if you guys have any questions, I'm here to answer. <laughs>